Testing, testing, one, two, three. How do I sound? Please rate me. It's been long enough, hasn't it? Hello and welcome back to another episode of Forts Per Chapter, Birth of the Killer Edition. My apologies for the long wait. Some stuff came up in that pesky real life of mine. But I wasn't uh, a video series fading, for want of a better term. And um, we're going to continue this right now. In the previous chapter, Larton took refuge in the crypt and found Seba Nile. In this chapter, we're going to see... Well, we're going to see what we're going to see. I assume we're going to see his relationship with Seba Nile begin to unfold. I don't quite remember. Let's find out together. So the very first action Seba Nile takes in this chapter is to sit down, offer food to Larton in the form of an apple, but also cut it with his sharp fingernails. Uh, which both immediately illustrates the fact that Sebenile is generous and probably a good person, but is also very capable of deadliness. That was a really good way of phrasing that, well done me. There's an element of lethality to him, there we go, that sounds better, doesn't it? We're just leaving all the bloopers in as we go today, I feel silly. But yeah, Seba was originally going to give Larton half of the apple, but when he saw how hungry Larton was, Seba gave him the entire apple, what a gent. It's interesting, knowing that Seba Nile, like most vampires, prizes strength and looking after oneself, it's interesting to note how generous he is here. Because after, you know, giving Larton the entire apple, which is revealed to be the only apple that Seba has, he also mentions that Larton can help him hunt later, or he can just wait here and Seba will bring him back some more food. This makes me think that Seba Nile is not considering Larton for the vampire clan at this point. He's just seeing a, a child who needs help. Either that or he's testing him, because the phrasing is, or I can bring food back for you if you prefer to remain where it is warm and dry. I don't quite remember how this goes, we'll find out in a second, but maybe maybe he's thinking if Larton wants to remain where it's warm and dry, maybe he's not cut out for the vampire clan. It's also a little tragic that Larton doesn't know why Seba's helping him. I mean, you know, it's good to be wary of strangers uh, who give you food uh, or sweets in a modern society, uh, but also just the idea that Larton's grown up in a society that's never given him anything, so why would he trust this person giving him food? You're living in a crypt, Larton said. You can't be up to any good if you're staying in a place like this. Seba raised an eyebrow. I could say the same about you, young pup. I mean, it's a good point. Larton's also staying in a crypt. Maybe he's up to no good. In fact, he kind of is. Seba tells Larton he doesn't need to tell him what Larton's just been through, but he might find it easier if he does, which means that Seba believes in the power of therapy. Well done, Seba. Based Seba. I love how forward Seba is with the fact that he's a vampire. Uh, Larton shook his head. You first. What are you doing here? I often stay in places like this, Seba said. You sleep in crypts, Larton asked? Usually. Why? Because I am a vampire. Larton frowned. What's a vampire? And that immediately uh, relates to us, the reader, as well. Like, this is taking place in a, in a world before Bram Stoker's Dracula. Vampires aren't necessarily part of the, uh, you know, the, the list of horrors that kids are supposed to be afraid of. Like... It's a good question, right? Did vampires as a concept exist when Larton was a child? Probably not. I'm guessing Darren Chan, the author, did some research on this. It's a nice little, uh, it's a nice little nod to the fact that, hey, yeah, times are different hundreds of years ago. We didn't have Twilight. <laughs> we didn't have the critically acclaimed series of Cirque the Freak novels. You know, we didn't have Dracula. We didn't have this idea of what a vampire could be. Then again, maybe the idea did exist because Seba then asks if he's not heard the tales, but this could be more from a lore standpoint uh, of within the series. Have you perhaps heard of a living dead? Uh, John Romero, not born yet, so probably not. Sorry, George Romero, shit, I always get those two mixed up. It is interesting that Seba refers to the vampires as the living dead, because as I was questioning earlier, I don't recall if it's ever actually mentioned whether vampires' hearts stop, whether they're actually literally the living dead, or if that's part of a mythology around them. Because vampires in these books are very much linked to, like, ancestors of wolves, weirdly, more than they are, like, you know, actual living undead. Although, I guess we'll talk more about this when we get around to doing Cirque the Freak, very there is a lot of fun played with that idea when it comes to Darren's turn to become a vampire because, of course, they fake his death. So in a metaphorical way, Darren Chan, the character, is undead, but that's that's a can of worms for a completely different series of novels. You could also say the same thing of Larton, though, because given that he's never found, he is probably assumed to be dead after a few days, right? Okay, so Larton doesn't know what vampires are, but he's heard of bloodsuckers, which Seba is very happy to hear. He says, now you have it, Seba beams, or beamed, sorry, we're in the past tense, this isn't the Demonata series. Now, it's a little difficult to get all this exposition about vampires, uh, who they are, how they work, 
what differences there are between the vampires in these books compared to mythology as we know it. And I would say from memory, it's been a while since I read it, a year or two, uh, but the vampire's assistant in the Cirque du Freak series doesn't do a fantastic job with it. I believe there's literally just a chapter which is like a Q&A with like Darren and Larton uh, where he's learning about vampires, but this does it a little bit better. It's not perfect in my opinion, but it's like, you know... Martin's asking questions, Sieber's answering them, but it's more conversational than, like, a literal list of things to be confirmed or denied. There's also the question about, like, are you supposed to be reading this as, like, the first book in the series as a prequel series, or are you supposed to be reading this after Cirque de Freak, which already explains a whole bunch of rules about vampires? We do get a lot here, but I am going to be keeping an eye out for things that we don't get. For things that don't get mentioned. The way the rules of the vampires uh, is explained to us here is half in conversation and then it's kind of like skimmed over. Uh, like when Larton asks Seba why did uh, Seba get blooded? Um, or why did Seba's master blood him? Seba says I wanted him to. Seba explained how vampires aged at one tenth for human rate, meaning they could live for several hundred years. He told Larton of their great strength and speed, the codes of honour by which they lived. He explained about the hardships, the way humans feared and hunted them, how sunlight killed them after a few hours, their inability to have children, so it is still kind of like rattling it off. It's like, here's what you need to know if you haven't read the original series, uh, but seeing as you probably have, here's just like a catch-up. I think a good way uh, of showing how exposition is done right is probably, uh, again I haven't read it for a bit, but Tunnels of Blood, where we're first introduced to the Vampanese. Um, by the way, I've never heard it said out loud. I assume it's pronounced Vampanese and not Vampanese or something weird. Um, but yeah, Vampanese, the introduction to Vampanese, I think, uh, is a lot more subtle than the introduction to vampires in both versions of the books. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's not like a bad thing. It's just it's a lot to try and get into a reader's brain. But in Tunnels of Blood, we learn more about it as like a story plot point and less like, here's what we can do, here's what we can't do, here's the rules we live by, blah, 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 blah. Although the rules they live by is definitely something that you learn more about across the entire Cirque du Freak series. Anyway, let's continue. We're told that Larton fully believes in the world of ghosts and magic and demons and witches, so he's not surprised to find that a vampire exists, but he is fascinated by them. Which is a nice contrast, of course, from... You know, I mean, I guess in the Cirque du Freak saga, Darren Chan, the character, is a little mesmerised uh, by the fact that they exist, but he, he does, part of him does believe in them because he is a child. But still, it's a nice change from what you might expect of, like, the scepticism of modern day society, where it's like, okay, none of this stuff really exists. Larton lives in a world where there are more possibilities because less of a world has been discovered and understood. We're given more of a listed exposition again. Seba told Larton some of the many myths about vampires. Crosses were meant to frighten them. Holy water could burn them. You had to drive a stake for a vampire vampire's heart and cut off his head and bury him at the center of a crossroads to stop him rising again. They could change shape and turn into bats or rats. All rot, Seba snorted. The hysterical rantings of superstitious fools. Interestingly, uh, Seba confirms uh, the existence of ghosts and witches, which is true in the lore of this universe, but it's interesting that Seba knows about them. But then he also knows about Mr. Tiny, doesn't he? I think. We'll learn as we go through. I like this line. Finally, when Seba felt the boy had learnt enough about the world of vampires for one night, he reversed the question. And you? He asked gently. Why are you here, so far from home and other humans? I love the way he asks why he's away from other humans. It's like Larton is like a sheep away from the flock, uh, and it emphasises the difference between Larton and Seba. And Larton answers the question, beginning with... I killed a man. Seba nodded slowly when Larton had finished. From what you say, that wretch of a man deserved to be killed. Aye, and long before you struck the fatal blow. But murder always hurts. It is right that we grieve when we kill. If we did not feel pain, we would kill more freely. And what would the world be like then? Um, I think it's Seba who talks to Darren the character in the Cirque de Freak books, uh, in like the Vampire Mountain trilogy, when they discovered a Vampanese hiding in the caves, and Darren, Darren's like, yeah, we should go and kill them all. And then Darren kills one of them, and he's like, oh my god, fuck, what have I done? Uh, so I like this bit of continuity that Seba's like, yeah, even when you, even when you're like killing righteously, 
looking for i mean you know that's how this goes in this world uh it's still not great siba tells Latin that he is not evil for killing Traz because it wasn't premeditated basically because it wasn't cold-blooded it was in the heat of a moment it was revenge and you know it wasn't the best thing in the world but it doesn't make Latin evil mostly because Latin's upset about it uh and you know this isn't necessarily logic i would apply to uh a real person in the real world but in the terms of uh, this timeline and this universe yeah it, it adds up it makes sense you don't think it was wrong Latin whispered of course it was wrong, Siba said. You took a life that was not yours to take, and that should haunt you far into the future. See, it's, yeah, it's nuanced. It's cool. I feel like some of Darren the author's ideals might be coming out when Siba says, The truly evil are those who willingly follow the path of violence when they find themselves on it. You have a choice now. You can embrace the darkness within you and become a monster, or you can reject it and try to lead a good life from this night on. I think there's a lot of talk in the Vampire Saga and the Demonata Saga about, like, doing awful things for like a greater good um but not necessarily the way you know the greater good is always something that's a bad thing in the harry potter books right so it's not necessarily the same thing there but i don't know we'll explore it more as we go but i think darren shan the author is very much interested in blurring the lines between right and wrong and exploring the the area in between which as siba argues is where most people live then we get to the point where Larton admits that part of him enjoyed killing Traz because it made him feel powerful which makes sense because Latin's been raised in this environment where this man has been uh you know basically slave driving him his entire life so killing trans is the first real moment of like power and agency Latin's had in his life but because he's young he doesn't really separate that out from the whole act of killing so he just thinks that makes him a monster you get the impression Siba's actually a little bit disturbed by this because he also mentions that he kind of wanted to stab out Traz's eyes and now we're definitely getting to the morally gray territory for sure so Siba's like but you restrained yourself, right? <laughs> and then Siba goes on about how vampires can taste evil in a person's blood. It has a sweet tang to it, and this isn't really something I ever really questioned uh, back in the day when I used to read these books, but now I'm like, that, that, that's a bit weird. That evil has, like, a physical side to it. I don't really... But then this is also a book which has, like, actual literal physical fate and destiny, so I guess it ties into those themes. I personally find it more interesting if evil isn't, like, a actual physical attribute in a person, but is more of, like, a a question of identity and self and what you're willing to do and what turns you down that road and... But, you know, that's just me. I do like the idea that the taste of evil blood is sweet. It's not vile and bitter, like you might expect. It's sweet. It always comes wrapped in sweetness, uh, as Siva says, which also kind of feeds into this idea of modern society and, uh, you know, how corporations work with, like, <laughs> I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of pulling from, from my ass here, but uh, y the idea that, like, fast food companies and sweet companies are, like, contributing to the to the bad health of, the, of society, but they're profiting from it, so they continue to do so. So you can see that as a kind of evil. So I, I don't know if it's really meant to be a direct metaphor for something like that, but it does bring that to mind. Also, I'm going to get wrapped up on this evil thing. Siba mentions that the test isn't foolproof and that sometimes they can make mistakes, which leads me to believe that maybe this isn't, like, a absolute honest truth of the world uh, that evil can be tasted in a person's blood um it or like it's more grave than that basically like someone might have like traits of evil in their blood but not entirely and it could be that doing evil things and going down that road is something that affects your blood not the other way around but you know just ruminating here. I think, despite the fact that Siba is telling the truth here, I think Larton has a certain naivety to him at this point because he just goes with everything Siba says. Like, oh, you'll be able to taste evil in my blood? Go ahead. Oh, you won't hurt me if, if there's evil in my blood? Fine, that sounds good to me, you know? Like, I get that he's, uh, he's young but i would have a little bit more suspicion although he does have this moment of fear when siba starts to suck his blood he's like wait shit no he's gonna drink my blood dry okay so here's something i forgot which is interesting apparently Larton has mixed blood meaning that there is the capacity for evil within him so that kind of ties in with the theories i was saying earlier about it's not always black and white but this very much ties into Larton's themes as someone who isn't necessarily 
a good person in their heart. There's someone who... Because... At the beginning of the Cirque de Freak series, Larkin Krebsley is painted to be more of a villain than an ally and a friend. Um, and so I think that's something that Darren the author probably wanted to explore more in Larkin's backstory. Um, so it, it's fun to get this, you know, outlook because... Well, I mean, actually, this is a theme for Darren the character as well, because Darren has this destiny to become, like, this evil ruler destroyer of the world, but <laughs> we'll get to that. And you see it in, like, Grubbs Grady as well in the Demonata series, although we won't really be talking spoilers about that here. Um, but, like, he's he's not a straight-up good character either, so I think Darren Shandy author likes to play with protagonists who are not the heroes necessarily. It reminds me of the cover for Skullduggery Pleasant by Derek Landy and it's got that picture of Skullduggery <laughs> and it's just like, and he's the good guy. Slight tangent but I've only ever read the first book of that series and I've always wanted to read more of them. There's this nice moment where Seba says I must leave you now and he's going to hunt and Latin's afraid because not because he's going to be left alone in the crypt, but because Seba might be leaving him, which is nice. It's like showing us that a bond has already kind of formed here. And now, even though Seba is still leaving to hunt without Larton beside him, uh, we do get the first instance of Seba kind of like getting Larton ready for this vampire life because Larton smiled and shivered. Could you start a fire before you go? No. Seba squatted by the boy. We light fires on occasion, but we do not rely on them. A vampire must be willing to endure discomfort. If you wish to be my assistant, you will need to accept that. So he's very quickly <laughs> coming to some assumptions, although I guess it has been going this way. And similarly to that scene we saw of Seba leading Larton into the darkness of a crypt, we see him leading Larton to the darkness of becoming a vampire here, where Seba purrs. He says, answer me this, where else will you go? Because I, I, I skipped over this bit, but Larton was like, who said about anything about me becoming your assistant? So Seba's like... Who, who will accept one of the damned other than a family of the cursed? Where will a creature of darkness hide if not in the shadows of the night? And Latin's like, damned? Oh shit, I'm damned, oh no. But I mean, he's got a point, Latin. I don't know what Latin's thinking here, but buddy, you just killed a man and there was a mob chasing you and this is the only person who you've ever met who's shown you kindness. Also, Seba says that vampires learned long ago that they could find nobility in the depths of damnation, and honestly, nobility in damnation, that should be like, if a vampire clan was like a house in Game of Thrones, that should be their house words, <laughs> nobility in damnation. Oh boy, this chapter is still going, huh? This is a long one. So I've got to the point where Seba's essentially offering Latin <laughs> the job for want of a better term. Uh, and this is something that I was very concerned with when I've mentioned how we were read that chapter about Larton meeting Seba when he was a kid, right? How we were given that as a preview to this series. And I remember thinking, but hang on a minute, there's a scene in The Vampire's Assistant where Darren asks if Larton was blooded as a boy, and Larton shakes his head sadly because he was not. Uh, and this is when Larton's feeling regret for blooding Darren as a boy, right? Um, so I was initially concerned that this would be, I guess, forgotten, although I should have known better, of course. Uh, and this is, like, addressed here, like, oh, you'll become a human assistant until, you, until you're older, and then you can become, like, a half-vampire and a vampire, uh, which fits the lore and is cool, because, like, having to keep up with a fully-strength vampire is a great way to, like, introduce some, like, some of the hardships of being a vampire into someone, you know, like, trying to keep up with literally a superhuman, um, and their expectations of you is, like, some, some hard-ass training if I've ever seen it. But it also raises the question, why didn't Larton consider having Darren for a human assistant instead of immediately blooding him as a half-vampire? But I guess that's Mr. Tiny doing some brain-tickling shenanigans, isn't it? It's also, uh, a kind of, like, a a probatory period, I guess, uh, because if you blood someone who doesn't turn out to be a very good vampire, the only real way to get rid of them is to kill them, right? Like, I think that's pretty much been alluded to in the past, like, if if someone's a bad vampire, they get killed for it. Uh, so this is a fun way of being like, we'll see how you do as you grow, uh, as a human, and then if I think you're a decent chap, sure, I'll blood you. And maybe this isn't common practice, maybe this is just something Seba does, I don't really know. Uh, but again, given that Larton pretty much styled his entire character on Seba, you think he would do what Seba did to him. It also makes sense when Seba has that outburst. I think it's Seba. Maybe it's Garvener. But someone has an outburst in Vampire Mountain like the 
boy's a vampire when they discover that uh, Darren Shannon, the character, has been blooded. Um, which, you know, at the time, I think I remember reading it as like, well, why would they be surprised? Why would you bring a human to Vampire Mountain? But again, now it makes sense, this idea of you have a human assistant before you turn them into a vampire. Actually, sorry, this is my first time thinking about this properly. It also makes more sense why they would want Darren, the character, to do the trials of... Is it trials of blood or trials of fire or something? Because... He had never been tested in that way, but the human assistants have been tested before they get blooded. So a very, very deft bit of prequel writing here by Darren the author. Well done, sir. Seba turned to leave, then paused and without looking back said, You do not have to be alone. The world never inflicts loneliness upon us. That is something we choose or reject by ourselves. And that's a very fucking good quote, and I've seen it quoted around on the internet from this book before, and I just wanted to point it out. It's it's very good. It's not always true, of course, in life. Uh, loneliness is a massive problem in this country, uh, and it's usually amongst older people who have lost loved ones and kind of like don't know how to connect with new people and stuff like that. Uh, but there is, depending on your circumstance, this could be good advice for someone who's like trying to shut themselves off from people who's like, you know, obviously like not all advice is made for everyone, but I think this is a good quote. In this instance, of course, you know, Larton very much needs to find someone who cares about him like Seba does, and Seba is very much saying that to Larton. I kind of wish Darren the author hadn't included the line, he could tell that this was a moment of destiny, if he made the wrong choice he would regret it probably sooner rather than later. Um, it, it's a little on the nose, I feel like you could have evoked that feeling without necessarily writing it in there. But I'm not a best-selling author, so what do I know? <laughs> Seba had said that Larton would have years in which to choose. He wouldn't be blooded until both of them were sure that this was the right thing for him. But Larton knew in his heart that the choice he made tonight would be binding. If he turned his back on humanity now, it would be forever. We've got some nice kind of like decision making in a monologue from Larton where he's trying to decide, you know, on the plus side, it would be cool being a vampire, having all these powers, learning, living a long life and, you know, having belonging somewhere, that kind of thing. Uh, but then on the other hand, like if you start going down this path now, it, it, you know, it's not a good idea to start going down a bad path. It's harder to kind of like leave. So he should leave now instead of just kind of like sticking with it to see what happens. Darren the author does like to play with this idea of like warnings from characters that, hey, you know, I'm telling you, you can do this or you can not do this, but you have to make your decision. And it's like a moment of destiny and the character almost deciding not to. Uh, this is something that happens a lot in Cirque du Freak. Uh, like, in the actual Cirque de Freak, where he's like, oh, you know, this isn't a perfect show, some people could get harmed, if you're, if you're afraid, you should probably leave. And, you know, they almost do, and some people actually do. It's like a similar thing going on here. And given what we know about fate in this world, it's almost like an illusion of choice, really. When he was satisfied with his choice, Larton shrugged off his clothes and sat in the darkness. His teeth chattered, and he shivered wildly. But after a few minutes, he figured that wasn't the way a vampire's assistant should behave. Straightening his back, he fought off the shakes and goosebumps and sat to attention, steady and calm, patiently waiting for Seba, his master, to return. Blimey, that was a long one, wasn't it? That is the end of part one of Birth of a Killer. Remember, th these books are divided into parts, so this is part one, so there's a small time skip for part two. I'm not going to ramble on too much longer because this already has been like a double length episode, uh, but yeah, this was probably one of the most important chapters in the entire book because we learn about vampires and Latin makes his decision which leads to him becoming a vampire. But, uh, oh, pardon me. You're welcome for leaving that in. Uh, if you like this video, <laughs> if you like that, but please give it a like, uh, leave a comment, letting me know what you thought, and I will see you in the next one, which I'm not sure when it will be. Uh, it might not be daily like it was before, but I'll see what I can do.